All right, so good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mark Pinto at Phoenixville Public Library, and glad to have you all here tonight for this presentation on what we can do to boost our immune system. You've been hearing a lot during the pandemic about uh, the role of our immune system in fighting off the virus and even uh, reacting to the vaccines. Uh, so we're glad to have with us tonight award-winning local physician, Dr. Anna Negron, to tell us what we can do to keep our immune systems strong. Dr. Negron is a member of the National Advisory Board for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. She's also volunteered in practicing at clinics for the uninsured and underserved, including the Phoenixville Clinic, where she also serves on the board of directors. Dr. Negron, welcome, glad to have you tonight. Thank you for this invitation. Glad to see you all virtually here. I'm sure you're enjoying this lovely weather, greening outside, right, and still light. And as Mark says, I have been active in medicine for 40 some years. For the last 20 years, food has been an important and integral part of my practice because we make ourselves out of what we eat. We make our immune system, we make our blood cells, we make our energy out of what we eat. And the rest is just a temporary patch that would just control symptoms. So it has been really my pleasure to learn and learn and learn and practice and help people regain their health. Besides uh, what Mark says that I volunteer at the clinic in Phoenixville, I have a nutrition practice where I consult with patients, not replace their family physician, but consult with patients to transition them to a healthier diet so that they can get rid of their inflammation and many of their medications. I teach family medicine residents the role of food, of plant food in medicine because they don't get this in medical school. And um, I lecture and it's my, my pleasure to lecture to the public and as a public service, because this information is not for sale. This information is not supplement driven or industry driven or um, industry. It's really regaining our wisdom, our body wisdom, coming back to our roots, which is really the way we were nourished many, many, many years ago, and which has sadly been pushed aside over the last maybe 50 years uh, or more um, for the benefit of the processed food and animal-based foods. And we only have to look around to see where that has taken us. So without further ado, let me share screen and start with our presentation, which brought you here, maybe because you've been leaving it for the last minute to boost your immunity. <laughs> so let's try to do it in a hurry. And don't be mistaken, we can boost our immunity in a hurry. And it might take two weeks, for you to really regain some fantastic headway in terms of being protected against the ravages of something as horrible as we have been dealing with this last year, the coronavirus. Oh, I am also a, the proud uh, author of a book which um, the library has for your pleasure and you can take, check it out, take it out and, and learn from it. So the question I'm asking you tonight, just right off the bat is, are you here just for the entertainment or are you open for changing your diet if it could boost your immunity? All these diseases that you see all around you and maybe you are suffering from some of them, of all these diseases, overweight and obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, which is the number one killer, 
diabetes, which leads right into it, cancer, which is the number two killer, and then all the other sundry of joint aches and acid reflux and headaches and sleep disorders and digestive complaints and constipation and bloating and fatigue and other serious things like multiple sclerosis or Alzheimer's. Well, 80% of this is associated with diet and the underlying chronic inflammation. If 80% of it is associated with diet, what are we doing managing these diseases? Why aren't we getting rid of them? And then add COVID, COVID-19 to this inflammation. Well, this is how you have heard in the news that the people with the most uh, compromised metabolism are the ones who have suffered the most. And they have suffered, well, the complications and many have not survived. In, ha in fact, too many have not survived. Well, let's go straight to the chase. You know, what causes the most chronic inflammation is animal protein, not fat, not flour, sugar, but animal protein. And the reason for that is complicated, but actually rather simple in, in a sense. Our bodies respond to the animal protein in ways that it doesn't respond to the plant protein, generating free radicals, cytokines, inflammatory prostaglandins, because it recognizes it as something too close to home that should not be roaming around in our bloodstream. Plant Plant proteins are just a little different, are all a little off, and they will really never incite such a, a reaction from our bodies. And when we talk about animal protein, we're talking about all the animal meats, all the animals that we share the same kind of animal protein. So we're talking about cows, chickens, pigs, turkeys, fish, and we're talking the worst of them, which are bacon and fried meats, but also dairy products. They are liquid meat, basically. Milk, yogurt, the cheeses, and the ice cream. They're all made with animal protein. You can take the fat out of some meats. You can take the fat out of some cheese and milk, but you cannot take out the protein because that's what makes the thing the thing. If you take out the protein in meat, you have nothing, you have fat. It does not resemble what you went to the grocery for. And of course, egg whites, which is the protein of the egg. Now, acute inflammation, just to get the, the story straight, acute inflammation is that which happens in your body when you get a stab or a slash or um, an infection, you know, that a pustule, your body generates inflammation that goes straight to the area, surrounds it, eats up the garbage, and then starts to regenerate healthy tissue. So if you had a, you know, a, a knife cut, or you had a, a puncture wound, you know, with a nail, or uh, any, uh, or a contusion, you know, with a hammer, or that calls for the body to bring everything it can to heal that tissue. That acute inflammation is life-saving and it will take maybe seven, 10 days, maybe at the most two weeks. So thank goodness for acute inflammation. Chronic inflammation, however, is this generated by this something that's flowing in your bloodstream that does not have a particular focus where the body can send all the the army of you know immune system to knock it out so instead it just roams about the bloodstream causing some of the aches and pains that you feel some of the bloating some of the headaches some of the fogginess some of that just not feeling uh, that you have enough energy and that chronic inflammation is hurting healthy tissues 
to the point that you end up in time with damage to your coronary arteries, damage to your bronchi, damage to your joint tissues. So chronic inflammation leads to these diseases that I mentioned earlier or that were on the screen earlier. Uh, and they can be devastating. Heart disease, number one killer, more than a half million people die every year of heart disease and cancer, which really we have done nothing in terms of the incidence except for lung cancer. And why was that? Because we eliminated the cause of it. We eliminated the smoking. So if we eliminated the cause of the chronic inflammation that we're left with in terms of food, we could get rid of heart disease, we could get rid of diabetes, and we could get rid of so many of the chronic inflammatory conditions that um, have people, I should say, disabled at, an, to, at a premature age. This is what happens in chronic inflammation in your coronary arteries. And if you pay attention, these are two sets of slides. The first two are long and the second two are a little bit more squared. And if you see, these are coronary arteries that are filled with a dye so we can see the blood inside and we can see the flow. In the left, in the farthest to the left, you see that there's an area where there's really like a very, very narrow, narrow place where the blood hardly can go through. Well, that's plaques, cholesterol plaques in your coronary arteries. They can be reversed. They're, they're the result of chronic inflammation. They're the result of high cholesterol. They're the result of you know, your diet. And they can be reversed in uh, 90 days, a year and a half. I mean, immediately it starts to clear out when you stop inflaming your arteries. The second set of slides, the same thing. And you can see the difference in flow inside those arteries before and after. A dietary pattern of animal foods and processed foods also does something else. It deposits fat where it shouldn't be deposited in your muscle and liver, causing insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is what causes diabetes. So as you see, I am talking about the two things that put us at most risk when our immune system is compromised further by something like the coronavirus. So when you have fat where you shouldn't have it, because you know you can have fat in your thighs and your bum and you know at the, the backs of your arms, that fat is really almost benign. But when you have fat where it shouldn't be, it's called ectopic fat in muscle and liver, then those, those tissues cannot function well. They're not designed to hold to fat and they cause insulin resistant and diabetes. These are places where we are making inflammation. These are inflam inflammation factories. When you gain weight around your waist, you better be sure that it's not just under the skin, it's also in your liver. And how many people today have what's called fatty liver? And again, you can live for 20, 30 years just with the unsightly you know, heaviness of your waist uh, without the declared disease, but you're courting disaster. This is what causes diabetes, fat in liver, and muscle. So the two graphics on the left are a fatty liver, all yellow, and a muscle that's filled with globules of fat. Now, we can clean it out. We can actually reverse insulin resistance by um, not putting fat and animal protein in our bodies and reversing this process. And this is how a fatty liver can become a normal liver again, and muscles can become normal again. And then you get rid of your diabetes. You get rid of your diabetes, provided, provided you continue to eat this way. 
Now, nutrition and lifestyle are the pillars of health. It's not just nutrition, right? It's other things too. When people say, well, you know, uh, it's uh, stress causes uh, disease. Well, it contributes. The pillars of health are diet, number one. And the closer we eat to a whole foods, plant-based diet, the better off we are. And a diet like that, that limits alcohol. So we're not talking about being 100% or being perfect. We're talking about really moving away from the heavy meat and processed food to the whole plant foods spectrum. Now, regular movement throughout the day. These joints aren't make, made for nothing. So we should really be moving all, all day long and many times a day and 45 minutes twice a day is minimum. Think about that. We should be getting up in the morning and walking 45 minutes and at the end of the day, doing something similar for another 45 minutes. Now, if you say that's too much to start with, start with 15, 20 minutes. I bet you pretty soon you'll be moving and really you'll be enjoying the movement and you'll be craving the movement because your body wants that. Restorative sleep without drugs. We should really be having a good night's rest. Maybe the average which we've grown up thinking is, is true about eight hours. Um, and it should be one that you really feel tired and, and you just fall asleep and don't wake up maybe once or twice to go to the bathroom, but, you know, but wake up in the morning refreshed. Another pillar of health is to limit toxic stress. And uh, um, along that to not smoke, of course, but toxic stress, I'm talking about being around people that are not good for us. <laughs> um, doing things that are uh, somebody else's agenda while your agenda is always put on second and third, that really um, undermines our wellness, undermines our health. And it's not that we don't have to have any toxic stress in our lives, but we should really shrink it to size, manage it, put it in some place where we can say, now's the time for me to deal with it, but not, don't let it permeate the whole, your whole life. Live with purpose and learn new things. And this, I'm happy to say, is one of the things that protects us against Alzheimer's. Having many, many connections between neurons, all these billions of cells that we have in the brain, is what makes us resilient if for some reason, if you get knocked out. <laughs> we still have many, many more left. But if you really don't have many connections between the nerve cells, you just have two or three, you get one or two knocked out, you're left with almost nothing. And that's one of the risk factors in Alzheimer's. And maybe you don't know this, but 95% of Alzheimer's is preventable with lifestyle. Just like 95% of heart disease is preventable. Now you'd say, why medicine is just managing these diseases and not telling us, you know, well, for one, we have been in love with the food that hurts us. <laughs> and uh, the industry doesn't have much interest, you know, invested in making us change what's already good for them, lining their pockets. I mean, if you're buying their meat, cheese, eggs, processed foods, you know, oils, and who's going to change that? It's got to be us. And lastly, we should think about belonging to a supportive community. And I don't mean have a membership, but really have some people around us that are supportive, um, that don't judge us, that listen to us, with whom we could do things, with whom we can discuss books, or play games or go for a walk. And these are the things, or these are the characteristics of the people that are known to live in blue zones around the world. 
And the blue zones were discovered by the National Geographic, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago. And they're spread out over the world, Okinawa, Japan, Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and whoa, Loma Linda, California. So in California, there's a blue zone. And what are blue zones? These are places where people have been found to live 90 to 100 without disabilities. Because you can live 90 to 100 with, on a, you know, with a diaper or uh, having people do things for you. But this is different. This is people who are functional, fixing their fences, walking to their friends, making a productive life, being elders in the community as opposed to being pushed aside. And Loma Linda, California, because it makes it, it is a different community than the rest of the country because it is a Seventh-day Adventist medical center. And Seventh-day Adventists by religion don't eat meat, <laughs> eggs or dairy. Um, so, I mean, how could you better create such a, a a study, right? I mean, the people in Loma Linda have been studied and published for many, many years as enjoying longer life and less disease. Now, I ask my medical residents and I ask my colleagues, do you know Loma Linda, California? And they don't. Why don't we know this? Why can't we be a blue zone. Why can't you start creating your own blue zone in your own home, in your own neighborhood? Nothing prevents us from doing that. We don't need permission from anyone to live a healthy life. These are the people in uh, these areas. They walk together, they dance together, they exercise together, they hike. There's intergenerational communication. So the old folks are, we're not shipped out somewhere you know, on a hill, uh, separated from the rest of the population. Uh, we, they do yoga, exercise that is um, life-giving to the body. It doesn't have to be the same thing you did when you were 20 years old. You don't have to be playing tennis or squash, but to move. And of course, there's meaningful connection to the earth gardening, farming, collecting food, preparing food. And of course, what they have also in common is that they eat mostly plants. This is, the, this is what uh, identifies or characterizes the people from Blue Zone. They move throughout the day with purpose. In other words, they don't just go to the to the track and go pointlessly around 10 times, but they go places because they have to, they want to go places and they go shop food shopping or they go <clears throat> visit friends and take them food or they're socially connected. And again, they eat mostly plants. And I'll tell you what mostly plants is in a minute, but let me mention what exactly eating plants does for us and for that immunity and for our state of health and for our, our state of metabolic health. You no doubt have heard about the microbiome. I mean, this days is a, is a buzzword and the microbiome is in short, the five pounds of bacteria that live in our gut. <laughs> we have five pounds of bacteria that live in our colon and they're there for a reason. They're not just there because they happen to be there. They are there because they found a very nice place to live because we're throwing food at them and they pay rent. And the rent they pay is, in this, is either good or bad. So the good bacteria that eat plants because what they eat is fiber, the part of the plant that we cannot digest that gets all the way down to the colon almost unchanged, they say, yay, now's my chance. So that's food for them. They take that fiber, which we cannot digest because we don't have the enzymes and they can digest, they digest it 
and they give us short chain fatty acids in return, many of which go nourish the colon cells, go through to the bloodstream, help us balance the immune system and the lipids in our blood. Wow, that's really fantastic. We even get two calories per every gram of fiber that we eat that we wouldn't otherwise because we don't have the wherewithal to digest the, that fiber. We digest everything else but that fiber. Now that's the friendly bacteria, the friendly microbiome. Now in our gut, of course, there's also some bacteria that have found that we can feed them what they like. And there are, we, we would call them harmful because they like to eat eggs, they like to eat oils and meats, and they put out damaging or inflammatory substances as rent. And that trimethylamine, which is the most notable of them, when it gets into the liver, it gets oxidized and it's associated with heart attacks. So we'd rather really starve those bacteria, right? If I eat, because I have, I'm 73 and I have been plant-based for 33 years. If I eat a piece of meat today or, or an egg, my, I don't have the bacteria to create these harmful substances. But if I keep eating it for a few days, the bacteria will multiply and then will start to produce me harmful substances in return. This is how quick this happens. It happens within days. And hence the title of this talk, you know, can we boost our immunity in a hurry? Yes, we can. Just like we can damage it in a hurry, except that our bodies, because they are so well-designed, uh, are gonna try their best to keep us out of harm's way, no matter how poorly we, we treat our bodies. So this harmful bacteria, you know, will multiply and will wreak havoc with you and they will cause you stuff and damage or symptoms that you will not associate with your diet because you're eating it all the time and you just got used to it. So you get used to the fogginess, you get used to being tired, you get used to, and you say, it's in my genes, it's in my, in my family, it's, uh, I'm getting old. Nonsense. This is not, this is not the correct attitude. This is because we are making ourselves sick or we can regain some health. This is what the plate that, you know, the food pyramid became a plate in 2010. And one thing disappeared from the plate. And I want you to remember and maybe put it in the chat, you know, what, di what disappeared? The USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture had to remove one item from the plate. Well, that item is not there now. That item is meat. Why? Because there is just no question that meat is harmful. And it, they, it couldn't in all conscience stay on the plate. However, since this is not the plate that they published, they, they published another one, which you'll see in a, in a future slide. They kept something in turn instead of the meat they kept a word that is not even a food, it's a nutrient, they kept protein. Because in the minds of everyone, if you say protein, what do you think of? Meat. So the industry says, okay, okay, uncle, I will not, I, I, I won't insist on just being on the plate, but you gotta put protein there because that's the code word. And of course we don't need dairy, we need water, but the USDA also kept dairy on beside the plate. But let me bring us to the healthy you know, part, which is this is fresh produce. This, you don't need a label. This is what has all the nutrients, all the phytochemicals, all the antioxidants, all the things that fight 
the free radicals, all the things that help our immune system work the best. And you find them in the bulk section, you know, the grains and the legumes and the, and the seeds and the fresh produce. Do 90% of your shopping here. Do 90% of it here. And then go inside and, you know, buy a few things, but 90% of your food in your kitchen should come from fresh produce, legumes, grains, and fruits. And I'm gonna show you now a few slides rather quickly of what whole foods look like. I mean, this is a Napa cabbage, this is bok choy, these are um, green beans, these are cauliflowers, peppers, lemons, right? These are leaves of collard greens, on top of which I've put some uh, uh, garbanzo beans and some sliced onions and garlic and uh, a little bit of rice or quinoa and I topped it with shredded, raw shredded beets and carrots. And the leaves are so shiny and so green because I blanched them. In other words, I put them in, in boiling water for just, uh, you know, dunk it for one, two or three times until they become flexible so that you can then roll them up like a burrito. And you can eat 10 of these at five calories per leaf, as opposed to eating a burrito whose tortilla is 150 calories. See how, and, and the wrapping now of this is gonna be so much nourishing, right? The tortilla has no fiber. This is full of fiber. So a, a lot of it will get to your colon undigested after you've squeezed out all the, you know, other nutrition that we can suck out of it. And then it will feed our friendly bacteria down there. And boy, it will give us a rent, you know, that will be the envy of the block. And of course you have the roots and you can bake roots whole like that. You don't need to peel them. All you need to just rinse them a little bit and bake them. And these are not the only roots that you can bake, sweet potatoes, potatoes, beets, pumpkins. I put them all in the oven at the same time at 400 degrees for about an hour. The smell of caramelized carbohydrate and like a glaze. And then once they're done, I just let them cool off and you have for a week to slice and add to your meals. This is a, an acorn squash and you can just, you know, cut it in half, scoop it out and bake it over um, upside down. And then later fill it with some rice, beans and other concoctions, you know, mushrooms. Oh my goodness, how beautiful. If you have a, a feast, you know, a, a buffet, a, a party, a celebration and every two people have half of an acorn squash. Isn't that gorgeous? And you eat the whole thing, no trash involved. These are, well, uh, they're your steel cut oats and quinoa and blueberries and you can make, you know, whichever kind you want, but these are whole foods. These do not come out of packages of sugar and flour and cornflakes. And these are not processed in a factory. These are foods that have all their nutrients still in them. Of course, the berries and right now we have the abundance of fresh fruits. Um, soups, which are salads that are hot. <laughs> I mean, you can add everything you want to it, except the greens. I would add the greens at the very last moment when you're gonna enjoy the soup so that you don't destroy all the nutrients and the colorfulness of it is also quite appealing. And of course, rice, and it should be, you know, if you like rice, it, you should get used to the brown rice or the integral rice. And you can give it some color if you don't like the, the color of, of the gray, the gray color of the brown rice uh, by adding paprika and turmeric and, you know, different kinds of delicious spices, which by the way, are, helpful for our immune system. These are spices or plants that the, the world has fought over the possession of these spices. Spices make the world go round. 
salads, you know, and the more colorful and the more ingredients they have, the better and add fruits to them, add nuts, add grains, add whatever so that every spoonful or forkful has, you know, a mouthwatering deliciousness to it. You don't actually need a dressing. If you add slices of or wedges of mandarin oranges or a cubed apple, they lend their juices to the mix um, the they make their own dressing. Apples can be dressed with cloves and cinnamon and put in the oven and they make their own desserts. Um, so you can cook them, bake them for you know, 20, 40 minutes until they are really smushed down like this. And the, the water that comes out or the little water that you add it to the pan, it'll be like cider and you can just drink that, yum. The right amount of carbohydrates, protein and fat are embedded, embedded within the fiber of the whole foods. In other words, the whole foods as they come out of nature are perfect for us. We need 80% of our calories to be carbohydrate because that's what we use for energy, but it should be still part of the plant. It should not be carbohydrate as flour or sugar. That's the carb that we really should avoid. And then, of course, the imagination is uh, too short to, to, to go through all the textures, the flavors, the everything that comes out of the earth. The cruciferous vegetables, which are a fantastic and very, very helpful for our immune system uh, group of vegetables. And they include all the cabbages, the bok choys, the collard greens, the broccoli and the cauliflower, the arugula, the radishes, the rutabaga, the Brussels sprouts. I mentioned the collard greens. I mean, you have one for each day of the week and you will not be bored. And they add so much for us. They, they're subs this, some of the substances they have called sulforaphanes help us keep our killer cells chomping up cancer cells. So they're cancer protective. And they also stimulate the liver to detoxify anything that we need to detoxify. And if you're taking medications, you know they're toxic and your liver has to detoxify them. Why do you take them every day or even three times a day? Because the body wants to get rid of them as soon as you put them in your mouth. And all this is work for, for your immune system. If you keep your immune system so busy taking care of trash, how could it really protect you against the coronavirus? The right amount of carbohydrate, protein, and fat is also embedded, of course, in the seeds of the world and the seeds that we know of as grains, you know, the rice, the quinoa, the oats, the corn, the millet, the barley, and also the legumes, which are these seeds that grow in pods, all the lentils, the chickpeas, and every color bean in the world. They are full of carbohydrate and they have enough protein and fat. There's nobody around, nobody among us, which is fi uh, fat or protein deficient. We are dealing with not an, a deprivation of nutrients, we're dealing with an excess. This, what we are going to survive <clears throat> right now is not lack of, what we're going to survive is having way too much of the wrong things. This is my favorite lunch. This is my, what I call my power plate. And this plate has everything under the sun. Now you say, how can I do this every day? Okay, work with me here. You shred five beets and you put them in a container. You shred two pounds of carrots and put them in a container. You make a pot of lentils, two pounds of lentils, and you put them in the fridge. You cook whatever other grain you want. In this case, it was quinoa. You know, cook a whole bunch, a couple of cups of quinoa, and then chop up green leafy vegetables, your choice. Here it was Napa cabbage on the upper left, 
and bok choy on the on the right and and put them in sealed containers in the fridge once you close the door the light goes out there's no air there's no more you know uh degrading of your vitamins and minerals and all of that and then at the very top there's a sweet potato a purple sweet potato so all those baked roots that i mentioned earlier you know now i i slice them at my pleasure and i add them to my power plate and then i have sweet peppers and i have uh, some mango and then on the bottom right i have some sticks of uh tempeh that i marinated and i put in the oven and they come out crispy like like french fries this is aren't your aren't your eyes just going after this like so delicious well so you prepare this in advance as if you were a restaurant and then assemble it i mentioned i mentioned to you that i was going to show you these graphics right the left is the usda dietary guidelines of 2010 and the right is the one that i uh, showed you earlier, which is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, much more illustrating the actual foods versus the one on the left, which is just colors. <laughs> and of course, it has grains, fruits, vegetables, and as I mentioned, protein. I mean, you don't go and buy a pound of protein. Protein is in every food. Plants make protein. But this is a code word for meat. And I want you to guess how come dairy is mentioned by name. It's the only food that's mentioned by name. And in this year's dietary guidelines, the recommendation was increased to three cups a day with no basis, no scientific basis for this, because dairy being cow's milk is for the cow's baby to grow fast from 100 pounds to 1200 pounds in three years. We have no business drinking another species milk that does that to them. I mean, we have actually weaned our children already. <laughs> so what are we doing drinking a milk that does this to their species? We are not meant to be ingesting dairy. The casein, which is the protein of the milk, the animal protein in the milk, is labeled a carcinogen. This is my little, you know, tree. Leafy greens and vegetables should be at the bottom. Whole grains, legumes, fruits, nuts and seeds, less amounts, and all else, meaning your you know, your choice of poison, <laughs> whatever you want to add to your, to your uh, plate, you know, occasionally. Um, but the nuts and seeds in small amounts because they are powerful foods in terms of how much fat they have. And since we don't really go through the trouble of cracking them open, we really get them by the bag, we eat too much. Again, do your shopping, most of your shopping here. Remember that plants make everything we need. Plants make everything the animals need. The elephants, the horses, the cows, the, the giraffes, um, the gorillas. I mean, they eat plants and they make their bodies out of plants, out of the plant protein and fat. Carbohydrate is used for energy. Plants are replete with micronutrients, meaning those nutrients that we need only small amounts. They have all the vitamins we need except vitamin B12. And you should be supplementing your diet with a vitamin B12 a couple of times a week. Doesn't matter what preparation you buy. Plants are full of antioxidants. In other words, they help us mop up all the garbage that's produced you know, during our daily operation of this body. And they're full of phytochemicals, chemicals that are produced in plants, fiber, and there are 60, 70, maybe 80, 90% water, which is why they wilt when you leave them out. 
the plant-bound carbohydrates still in the plants are in good company. What I mean by plant-bound is not as flour or sugar, but inside the sweet potato, inside the squash, inside the legume. Carbohydrates are made in the plant by photosynthesis from water, carbon dioxide, and the sun. And they are our fuel. They power us with energy. So my question to you is, are you willing to try this for six weeks and boost your immunity in a hurry? And I mean, the recipe is simple. It's just hard to execute if you have not done this, but this is it. It's remove animal products, white flour, added sugars, oils, and factory foods, and say yes to everything else. This is the anti-inflammatory prescription. Eliminate animal products, eggs, dairy, oil, and factory food, and eat an abundance of whole plant foods, especially the cruciferous that we mentioned earlier, in a great variety of colors every day. And of course, if you still smoke, please quit. <laughs> <clears throat> These are, um, um, this is my last slide. I have a couple of documentaries that I hope you, you watch. One is called Forks Over Knives. And what it means is forks, the forks that we eat with, and knives, the scalpel that cuts you open to do bypass surgery, which by the way, is the number one revenue source for hospitals. It produces billions of dollars for hospitals. So there is really not much interest in the medical industry right now in changing things. And the other documentary that I really, really hope you watch, it's called Code Blue, Redefining the Practice of Medicine. And in a nutshell is a, a young physician at age 28 was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and against her physician's advice because she was put on lots of medications, was even in a wheelchair. Uh, she found some studies that showed something to do with food and multiple sclerosis. And she is now eight years um, free of disease, running marathons, free of any disability, the power of plant-based foods. And two websites that I want you to visit because I, want, I don't want you to be roaming about the internet and being sucked into rabbit holes. These are two very reputable places where you can just you know, sink your teeth in and really enjoy being nourished um, in a good way. The Center for Nutrition Studies, T. Colin Campbell. And if you have heard his name, he's the author of the China study. And the food pharmacy, which is a pharmacist turned food pharmacist who has a fantastically illustrated and beautiful uh, website and free recipes. They're online video and also for you to take home. So this is my presentation. I am um, stop sharing and take, we just have 10 minutes, but take some questions, some comments. Thank you, Dr. Negron. Please feel free to unmute yourselves now, folks, to ask any questions. Mark Pinto said to everyone, dairy, what did you mean by that? And Karen, to everyone, protein, what do, what do you mean by that? You had asked a question at one point, so that's where oh, we put right. the answer. <laughs> now I forget the question, but yes, yes. okay, very good. Good, because I didn't give the right answer. So. <laughs> But uh, any comments, please? I have a question. If you can please um, let me know about the nut milks because okay. that is um, readily available now. So very well. Okay, so nut milk, meaning that white liquid that we get when we squeeze nuts <laughs> uh, is not a necessity, but it is definitely a vast improvement over any kind of animal milk. Uh, the important thing is to make sure that it has the simpler ingredients, that if it's oat milk, it just has oat and fil filtered water, that if it's almond milk, it's just almonds and filtered water. In other words, 
read the ingredients and make sure it doesn't have added oils, which many of them do, safflower oils, or added sugars. You can add your own ingredients and make the milk, the plant milk to your, to your satisfaction. Um, so again, it's not necessary uh, in your diet, but if you want it because you'd like it in your oats and, you know, in cooking and, um, and in your smoothies and things like that, um, they're perfectly fine. It's a processed food, but it's closer to unprocessed than it is to the meats and cheese and dairies. Yes, is that, I hope that answered. Anyone else? There's some questions in the chat. Sorry. Yes. Oh, I, I, I did have a question on um, the lactate products, like lactate cottage cheese and milk. Just okay. even to put in tea, even slightly. Okay. Um, how you feel about them? Well, this is very important. This is not about my feelings, even though I understand the, the, you know, the expression. This is really about the science. So the, uh, the lactate is meant to help people who have lost their enzyme that digests lactose, which is the milk sugar, by, in, by adding that enzyme to it. In other words, by by uh, acknowledging that you normally should lose the enzyme, but then adding it back so that you can use the milk anyway. So it's like going against nature. And it has the plant, it has the animal protein. So you have not eliminated the, the harmful part of the milk. So you can reduce the fat of the milk, you can eliminate the lactose or add lactate, you know, like the enzyme to digest okay. it, but you cannot take out the animal protein, which is the casein or the whey, which are integral to the, to, and what makes milk, milk, you know, animal milk, milk, whether it's cow's milk or human milk or mice milk or elephant milk. I mean, it has those components. And they're not meant for us after we are weaned and we transition to the food of our species. Because what they're meant to do is grow an infant exponentially so that they can be on, you know, out of your arms and, and walking about and eating food. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Somebody asks about olive oil. Is it bad for you? It's not that it's bad for us, but it really has been revered. It has been put on a pedestal. And again, look around. There's nobody here that's fat deficient. And olives, you know, give us oil. Nuts give us oil. You know what? Uh, onions give us oil. So if you cook in a low heat, the onions release their oil. So there's really no need for oil in food. We are just used to it. I would say save the oil for any recipe or any food or any, anything where you really must, must have it because it would not be the same without it. But the, the use of oils as a matter of fact has really been detrimental for us. And all, even olive oil has saturated fat, which people who have heart disease should really avoid. What should you substitute for nuts? Uh, if you have them. Well, you don't have to not have them. I mean, you can have a few, just have less. It's continued on the next line. If you, if you have nut allergies. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. What should you, well, um, just eliminate them, you know, just eat everything else under the sun that the earth produces. Um, there is really nothing that will substitute a nut if you have a nut allergy, you might not be allergic to every nut, you know, you might be able to, you know, pick and choose, but, uh, you know, you might be able to uh, roast chickpeas and pretend they're nuts. <laughs> what about the ingestion of stimulants like tea, coffee, or other ca caffeine drinks? Well, you know, if we are using them to stimulate us, then there's something amiss with our nutrition. 
we should really be able to be energized. You know, I'm here today at, you know, eight o'clock, having drank a cup of green tea in the morning. Um, I drink it because I like it. Um, you know, I think it's, but it's not, it's not something that I must have. In other words, I wake up and I am refreshed and ready to go. If you're using caffeine, caffeinated the beverages, and you know how common and popular these boosts, you know, have been, uh, it's really because people are in a lethargic state, in a metabolic, in a sick metabolic state uh, that does not give them the energy that they need. And what we need is not protein. Protein doesn't give us energy. What gives us energy is the baked sweet potato, the oats and the berries and the rice and the beans. That's what gives us energy. That turns into sugar and we burn it as our fuel. Is Greek yogurt better than milk? It's made with milk. So any product that's made with milk is a dairy product. So no, the more concentrated, you know, the it takes seven pounds of milk to make a pound of cheese. It makes, um, again, you cannot take the animal protein out of the yogurt and call it yogurt, but you can make soy yogurt. You can make a yogurt out of a plant protein and get used to the taste. It's not a necessary food. Probiotics are not a necessary thing. We should not be relying on supplements. We should not be relying on pills. We should be relying on all the pictures that I showed you, actual foods. Wow, we are on time. Any other comments? Any hanging doubts? Okay, it looks like people are starting to sign up that are saying thank you. Yes, you've given us lots of foods for thought. Dr. Negro tonight, so. Fantastic. I mean, I am delighted that you've chosen to accompany us tonight. I, I wish we would talk about this more than just uh, hang all our, our hopes on one thing. I mean, we need the masks, we need the distancing, we need the washing our hands and we need the, the vaccine. But we don't need to wait for that to really boost our immune system. We don't need to wait for that to really, I, I told you in two weeks, your coronary arteries have less inflammation. And when you have less inflammation in your coronary arteries, you have uh, improved elasticity of your arteries. And if you have improved bronchial health, when you get the coronavirus, you're gonna be so much more protected. You're gonna be armored on the inside. And you will get, if, you, if we do get the, the virus, we will just not succumb to it. Isn't that? much better. I mean, we cannot live in a bubble, but we can live in a state of excellent health. And it's up to us. It's not up to the industry. The question that came through in chat there, are, are there particular foods good to fight high blood pressure? Exactly. Not to fight it, but to really surrender. <laughs> the, the foods that hurt are your arteries that make them stiff which is what makes the blood pressure up every time that your heart pumps. In other words, um, what hurts the lining of the arteries that keeps them from being elastic is salt, animal protein, and fat. So it seems so simple, right? It's, it's, it's just that we'd like to hear some good news about our bad habits. <laughs> and I, I'm not here to give them to you. I'm here to tell you straight that our bad habits are bad for us. And that if we've gotten used to them for a long time, uh, we are now being, you know, we're, hand, we're being handed the bill. And it, it takes 20, 30 years sometimes to develop the diseases. It's like a, you know, it's like an iceberg. You see the peak coming up but underneath it was forming for 20, 30 years. 
we know that because the young soldiers that died in the Korean War, which were, you know, of course, traumatic deaths, 1820, they already had atherosclerosis. They had no symptoms. Are There's we, a question okay. about restaurants in the chat. Are there restaurants that you can recommend that serve these options? Uh, not one that will that will be so fantastic for everything, but you know you can ask the chef, depending on where you go, to make you a uh, a plant meal without oils, and let them you know warn them in advance. If it's a place that would take reservations, you can call in advance, and um, some chefs would be delighted to show their wear and and humor you and present something delicious and, and beautiful and aesthetic. I mean, there's so much more that can be done with colorful foods and it can be done with a slab of meat. Uh, so no, I don't have any particular restaurant, but you can, you can um, get what you want in some places. What about salmon, sardines, omega-3 fatty acids? Okay, uh, the meat of the salmon and the sardine has omega-3s, but also has omega-6s. So it's, and it has animal protein. So again, we have, we have swung away from the fish oils and away from these uh, remedies, which for a while were like the thing for the day because they, are, they have not shown to be um, healthful and they have in many cases contributed to the disease. So, you know, when we make side moves, from beef to chicken, we're not really making anything, any headway. Chicken to fish, especially, you know, nowadays the fish that we get are fish that are either farmed underwater and or from waters that are toxic with heavy metal pollutants like mercury and lead. So remember, this is not about perfection. This is about making 95, 98, 99% of your diet, whole foods, plant-based, you know, pretend you are living in a blue zone and then every now and then have a little poison and it won't kill you because you are so well protected, right? But if you make a dietary pattern that says, I'm gonna eat, you know, fish and, and, and salmon because that's good for me and you make that your dietary pattern, you're walking into a trap. All right. <laughs> Very good. Thanks again, Dr. Negron. Thank, Bye, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yep, you're welcome. Hope something good. <laughs> thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks. You're welcome.